there, there was a Michael Jordan interview where he was talking about that as you get older in sports, you have to get better mm. because you're not as fast anymore. Yeah. And uh, so in order to compensate for your physical abilities, you have to improve your game. I always go back to like this Warren Buffett quote when he, you know, when people ask me, is this is today a good time to invest yeah. in property? And he says that, you know, like the way he does his business is he, he doesn't try to time the market. He looks for good deals and he knows because he's, you know, for example, the way we're banking on the UK economy and the fact that the UK housing is going to go up, he's banking on the Amer on the American economy. Yes. That in 10 years, in 20 years time, the American economy is going to be stronger than what it is today. Yeah. Ahmed, you're, you're a relatively young guy. How is it you've gone from zero to 3.2 million pounds of property, left university only a few years ago? How is it you've achieved that? Yeah, so, I mean, if, if we start from the start, finished university September of 2016, Okay. Uh, I, I did the normal corporate route. I mean, I tried to do the corporate route, which is I, I applied for jobs. I didn't end up getting a job. And so I started thinking, well, you know, what else could I do? And at that time, there were a lot of people who were doing, I mean, to be honest, even today, but this is what I find out about it. A lot of people were doing, they were renting properties and then they would sublet them onto Airbnb, Booking.com, yeah. uh, maybe some corporate agencies. And so... That, that was interesting, especially when finishing u university purely because you don't you didn't need as much money compared to you know buying properties and developing properties where yeah. you might need fifty thousand, a hundred thousand. So I found people who were doing this, and I said to someone that I'll help you with your deals. So I'll find investors, I'll you know view properties, those sort of things, and I'll take a ten percent cut. So I wasn't putting any money in; I was just helping someone do their deals. Right now, we did some in Elton Castle and some other areas in London, but. I had now learned pretty much the entire business without paying any real money or, or investing any money. So by the time I had done quite a few of those, now when I started doing my own projects, it made it much easier because now I could raise money and I could say to people, hey, I've been involved in mm. you know all these projects. And so would you lend me money or would you invest with me and we'll do something similar? And so that was an easy sell because I already had the experience from working for someone else for free. Started doing that from end of, well, not end of, from, from 3rd of January 2017 is when I, I took on my first property myself. Okay. So was that always the intention with this person to, so I'll work with this guy, I'll kind of build up my experience and then I'll go off and do my thing? Or did it just evolve that way that you're kind of helping this person, you're learning anything, actually, maybe I could do this myself? In, initially, I thought, well, if I just keep helping them and I'll keep making my 10, 20% cut, yeah. then that would be sufficient and that was a business model. But then once I did a few, I just felt out, well, why couldn't I just do the same thing myself and, mm. you know, get the full piece of the pie as opposed to just making 10, 20% here and there. Yeah. Plus it's, you know, I, I think when you're working for someone else, ultimately it's still their business, which are growing. So even if the business gets bigger, if they attract more opportunities, that's going to go straight to them as opposed to yourself. So I, I think it was, it was initially started off with, I'll just do this as the main thing. Yeah. But then it's, you know, you're, you're building, uh, what's, what's the saying? You're building your house and someone else's yes. land, right? So <laughs> so then I, I wanted to do my own thing. So it's sort of like transpired to that. Okay. What did that first deal look like? And how, how did you feel from actually I'm um, now have to go and literally stand on my own feet rather than buy somebody else's yeah, side? The first, first one is a bit of a weird feeling. Like when you make money for the first time from your own business, it's a bit of a weird feeling because... It just feels like you made money out of nothing. <laughs> like you yeah. just, you know, especially when I did, uh, when I was working for this person and I made a 10%, 20% cut, or even when I then raised money and then I did my first one. I don't know. It just feels like it kind of feels illegal in the sense that <laughs> it just, you have just made money out of nothing, right? Like, like nothing. It's not like, fine, if you go to a job, you're trading your time for money. So that's a different situation. But here, you know, you, you raised some money and you found a property and, because I remember, you know, I rented my first studio for £725 per month, okay. right? Uh, you rented this off of the landlord. I rented this from my letting agent okay. for £725 per month. Okay. And then the intention was I will put this onto Airbnb. Right. And I got a, the first month, I think it, the revenue was like 1400 or something, right? Okay. Now, so you made a profit after bills and, you know, everything of like, let's say £400, £500, yeah. or whatever that figure was. And it just felt like 500 pounds out of nothing because you've taken yeah. someone's funds and now you've found a property and you, for the same property, you're, you know, you're charging so much more. So I, I was pretty... It feels less tangible. You, it's not so you made something with your hands and you're charging for it because what you've done is use skill and acumen to pull something together. For sure. And you got rewarded for it at the end of the month. Yeah, it's, it's that whole 
alchemy thing, yeah. right? Which is the turning something into gold. I don't know, like what is it turning bronze into gold or something? That that's kind of what it felt like. That it, the fact that this property had already existed, it was on the market for seven hundred twenty-five pounds per month, mm -hmm. and the fact that using the exact same property you can make fifteen hundred pounds, yeah. it's it's kind of like alchemy in a weird sort of way. That yeah. it, it's not like you have created the property; the yes. property already existed, and you've just found a better way of making money from it than the other person had and as a result you've made money in the process so did you start building momentum then quite quickly going on to second third property or was it a bit more slow attraction to move on to second so third property I, I got a bit lucky because the first property I took on uh, this studio I took on for mm -hmm. 725 that was in a building which had which was a commercial conversion there was a hundred odd flats in that building. It had it had just come on the market. Okay. And so the letting agent had like 10, 20 properties available to let. Yeah. And for some reason, they just weren't moving that swiftly at that time. I think there was another couple of commercial conversions in Stevenage Town Center, mm -hmm. which had come on at the same time. So suddenly there was a saturation of availability of property. Like, okay. There was like 300 flats, which had, you know, just come onto the market. Yeah. So when I took that first one on, and when you're doing rent to rent, i.e. renting properties and then subletting, the first deal is always the hardest. You know, to convince the agent to get the first one is yeah. always the hardest. Getting the second, the third, the fourth is never as hard as the first one because yeah. you already have that relationship. So, took the first one um, in the 3rd of January. I think, I can't remember, it was like 14th of Feb or 18th of Feb. I can't remember exactly. Mm -hmm. By then, I had six. Right. And and they were all in the same well, building. It was quite quickly built up, yeah. Because, because the first one was getting so much traction. Mm -hmm. We took on another one. Yeah. The second we took that one on, that was pretty much fully booked for the next few months. Right. And so that just signaled, well, actually, there's a, probably a lot more demand than the amount of units we have currently. Yeah. Took another one that was fully booked out. And so that was like a good indication. And because they were all in the same building, you didn't have this worry that, well, if I took another one on, are they going to go to that place or not? Because they were literally all in the same building. One was upstairs, one was downstairs. One was, you know, one was on the second floor, yeah. third floor. You're probably gaining some economies of scale without really realizing it as well at the time. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Because yeah. when it came to even your processes and your systems, the check-in instructions of how people come in and how people leave, mm -hmm. it was just the same thing replicated again and again. Whereas if I had a property in a different location, then you wouldn't, yeah, to your point, you wouldn't have that situation because you would have to then think, well, how are the cleaners going to get mm -hmm. there? How is that laundry going to get there, whereas because everything was in the same building, that, that made it much, much easier. Yeah. So it was, it's, it's partly lucky, Jack. Yeah. Do you still have that first one? No, I don't have the first one. Yeah. I've got I've got two in that same building. Okay. So, of course, COVID happened in the middle. Right. When, you know, there's a lot of bookings wiped out. Yeah, that and so, changed things a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So COVID was a weird situation whereby what was happening was that sometimes the properties, weirdly enough, were fully booked, mm -hmm. but then they might not be booked for a period of time. Mm -hmm. Uh, because the way the COVID rules were changing, sometimes it would ease the regulations. Yeah. And then the regulations would come back into play. Then they would ease them. And so when I had some renewals coming up, you know, and this is, I think, end of first lockdown. Mm -hmm. Before COVID happened, I thought it was going to be a two-month stint. And by, yeah. you know, we'll, we'll sort of move on. This was like six, seven, eight months in. And then you have to think, well, do I want to take that much risk? Mm -hmm. Given when like, everyone's getting used yeah, to it, given travels like, all day. Yeah, correct. Given like, given we have no idea how long this is going to go on, because initially I thought a couple of months, mm -hmm. but by the end of the first lockdown, we were like six, seven, eight months in, and it didn't look like we were coming out of this anytime soon. Yes. Uh, so no, I don't have the first one. Yeah. I've got exactly the same one on the ground floor. Okay. Because it's uh, you know, with these commercial conversions. The floor plans are exactly the same from top to bottom. All the way down, yeah. Yeah, so the first one was number 135. I've got number 21, which is exactly the same okay. thing, but, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's it's on the ground floor. So Does it still perform quite well, the building there? Or do, uh, as over time, has it evolved in terms of how, the, how it's performing? <laughs> Last month, that studio uh, made a profit of £480 or okay. something. Uh, given the rent on that is about £700 and 90 pounds or 795 or something along those lines yeah. so i i think on average it would be slightly lower than what it was years ago mm -hmm. purely because with the nature of airbnbs it is, it is area dependent but you get more competition over time so when i started doing airbnb in stevenage if we, were, we were like the only ones doing airbnb in stevenage right right now of course as there's like more yeah there, there's a lot more commercial conversions there's a lot more competition not to say that it doesn't work because it still made 480 pounds last yeah. month, 
but it was even easier to make 480 pounds, yeah. you know, like a few years ago. So I think there's still a margin. Yes. But you have to be better. You know, there was a there, there was a Michael Jordan interview where he was talking about that as you get older in sports, you have to get better mm. because you're not as fast anymore. Yeah. And uh, so in order to compensate for your physical abilities, you have to improve your game. Yeah. And I think Airbnb is exactly the same thing in some areas or even HMOs or whatever the strategy is that when the market is not going your way, you have to get better. Mm. So right now, a lot of my focus is on BRR, essentially buying properties, adding a lot of value, and then refinancing. Yes. Now, when I got into property 2016, and I would speak to people about doing BRR, the way they were making money, they were essentially buying something, doing a plain refurb, and then either selling or refinancing, and they'd made a good margin. Mm -hmm. But the reality was, that didn't take much skill. You know, all you were doing was doing a simple refurb. But the market was moving so much, yeah. 2012, 13, 14, that by the time they bought something and they sold, yeah. you know, they made money in the middle. Yeah, because simply the market's rising anyway. So you're making profit, yeah. but actually your profit's being supersized because there's an increase in general market value anyway. Yeah, yeah. so it's, they, they didn't have to do much. Mm. Or they just had to buy anything which was in bad condition and they would have made money after six, seven, eight months. Now, it that is so hard to do today. You know, like to, to literally just buy something do a simple refurb and to make money, that that is so hard. So everyone I spoke to who was doing those those strategies, they stopped doing it after 2016 when the market went a bit flat because they realized they weren't going to make any money. Now, what what I started doing was I started buying one-bedroom flats, which I reconfigured into two-bedroom flats. So not only was I doing a refurb, I was also adding value by changing the layout and you know reconfiguring okay. the space. And so that actually made me more money. But if you think about it, that's a similar thing, right? When the market's not going your way, you have to then upskill and find a way of making money, which the which you know the normal person isn't thinking of. Yes, and I think Airbnb is the same thing that predominantly people use Airbnb and Booking. dot com, but there's there's like ten other ways of getting bookings, yeah. which which no one ever taps into because you know when Airbnb is going well, it's like everyone gets lazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's like. You know, it's like when it, what's that saying? Like, there's a saying something like, "Repair the roof while the sun is still shining," yeah. or something, right? Because when it starts to rain, <laughs> there's That's the right whole time to be doing it. Yeah, yeah. Then it chucks it down. Yeah, I, I know. In our uh, in our uh, SA business, the that we we've, we've been focusing on trying to not rely on Airbnb, mm. and when we can top up Airbnb bookings with our own direct bookings that's when the profitability really goes through the roof i agree because often and we talked <laughs> about this beforehand you know maybe there's 20 percent margin or something we're working on within service accommodation you're relying on you know maybe say 80 percent occupancy or 70 percent occupancy but if you can get another 10 percent above that that's just straight down to your bottom line in terms of profit yeah plus you mentioned direct bookings so you know, Airbnb now, I think the commission is 18%. I think so, yeah. With, with Booking.com, if you're on the preferred program and stuff, it's also 18%, right? Now, if you get a direct booking which doesn't have any commission, that's 18% like, you know, you're on, yeah. on your bottom line, which is which, which is huge. And But again, there was no reason to do any of that a few years ago, purely because, well, and to be honest, in some areas, you can still just get away with Airbnb. But I'm just I'm talking about areas which might be more competitive. Yes. So Birmingham is a big city. There's a lot of people doing Airbnb, and so yeah, getting a direct booking will definitely help for sure. Um, but but you don't think about that, you know, un until you really have to. Yes. And service accommodation we see as a, a cash flow strategy. So when um, I'm speaking to somebody about trying to formulate which is going to be the right route for them to make money from property, we think about it in t three categories. You're either creating cash flow each month, the service accommodation, HMOs, that kind of thing. Or maybe you're cashing out, like you're buying, renovating, selling, you're flipping, trading, that kind of thing. Or you're building equity for the long term, like a BRR type mm -hmm. strategy where actually because you've extracted most of your money back out, you're a little profit each month, but then you're building something up for the long term. So what was the transition then, uh, or the addition even, from moving from service accommodation to doing BRR? What, what even got you thinking about, actually, I need to do something different? Often people, when they build up good cash flow, they just want to do the same. I just want to carry on doing that. Well, you know, when I got into property, and, and I read a lot of books at the time, and uh, when I was at university, I was you know reading property books and working out, well, how do I invest? I think the initial thing people always find is buy to let, mm. and they get sold on the idea of, well, if I had X number of properties, and I could make 500 pounds per month per property, let's just say, then, well, if I get to 10, then 
I, I think property is as passive as it gets. Nothing is truly passive because yeah. there's always something you know going wrong. But it's on the spectrum of passiveness, it's pretty much as passive as it gets. So th that was the idea I was sold onto, which is that well, okay, it's, it's not that I want to you know just chill on the beach all the time. But I, I I you know I get bored you know after two hours when I go to a beach like I got like I need to do some sort of work. But it was more so like if if I want to have options in life if I want to do something else or if I don't want to work or if I want to uh, experiment with the business which is a lot more riskier then I need to have a certain amount of money coming in every month now like you say with Airbnb the benefit of Airbnb is it doesn't take much money and it's very high cash flow mm -hmm. but it's also much riskier than something like buy to let and in terms of the longevity we don't know what the longevity is right now because it's still in it's its infancy it's still new right it's yeah. still new we don't know if, if one day it's going to have planning if it's not going to have mm -hmm. planning especially and then when you look at the competition side of things maybe in 10 years time there's so much competition that maybe it doesn't work who knows I mean it probably still will work but I'm, I'm just playing devil's advocate here right whereas if I compare that to buy to let property investing they're supposed to be building 300,000 houses per year they build around 120,000 houses per year um, they've never hit that 300 target they, they, they've, they've never even come close to it yeah. right so we know in 10 years time 20 years time 30 years time the demand for rental properties is still going to be there if anything it's going to go even higher than what it is today so you have a business model which I'm willing to you know bet any money that it's going to continue to grow whereas with some of some of the business, business models like uh, Airbnb it's harder to say that right now right it, it exists because you're making money from a service correct essentially <laughs> And that service model may change. And the reality is that a lot of this business has been taken away from hotels. Mm -hmm. A lot of big, powerful hotel chains are not happy about that either. <laughs> yeah, so, so it could change. Yeah, so so exactly. And I, so I I always thought about Airbnb, and this is what I advocate to people as as a stepping stone to get into development. Yeah, that it, people mess like, up all the time, say I've got five thousand pounds, I've got ten thousand pounds. What do I do? And then I say to them, take on a couple of rent to rent Airbnb properties make £2,000 a month, £1,800 a month, £1,200 a month, start saving that up. And when you can transition, start transitioning mm -hmm. because that's going to make you a lot more money in the long run. Yes. But you need the stepping stone in order to get to the next thing. It's like, you know, you have to do GCSEs to do A-levels yeah. and you have to do A-levels to do university. You can't just skip that stage. It is almost like a prerequisite in order to get to the next thing. So I, I never saw Airbnb as... Well, it's like, you know, the be all and the end all. It was always, I need to do this thing in order to transition to the next thing. Okay. And then when I did the next thing, that was always a transition. You know, I needed that for the transition for the next thing. That's that's how I looked at Airbnb when I started. But from the time you started, literally with nothing in property starting at zero, when did you get to your first acquisition, your first purchase? Well, that's almost December 2018. Okay, so that was a uh, one-bedroom flat I bought in uh, Battersea Park in in I think it's just outside of Zone One. I think it's like the curb of Zone Two or something. Yeah. I can't I don't, I don't know exactly. That was a one-bedroom flat, ex-council on the fifth floor with no lift. Uh, it also had a lease restriction. That's why you look so fit. What's that? That's why you look so fit. Well, going up the stairs, <laughs> five flights of stairs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. To be honest, I've, I've only, finished on day one. To, to be honest, I, I've, I've actually got a different perspective on that. I've only been there twice. Really? Yeah, yeah. Most of my I like that. I, I've been there once or twice. Yes. I, I have found the ones which are further away, yeah. I tend to go to less. <laughs> Whereas I've done a project right now, which is a house into four flats, and it's two, it's, it's two minutes away from my house. See, I, the I was there like every four days, <laughs> you know, just, like, yeah. just to see the paint and stuff. Whereas there was one property I bought in Vauxhall, I, I, I've literally seen that like once, I think, to this date. I bought yeah. that in like 2019. Because it's so far, I was like, I'm not going to travel all the way just yeah. to see some paint. Whereas the builder can send me pictures or videos of the paint. Like, uh, you know, even if something goes wrong, I'm not skilled to fix anything anyways. So, so why would I go all the way to Vauxhall when I can't do anything? Have the conversation. Yeah, yeah. to have the conversation, exactly. And, and COVID helped with that process as well because you couldn't go anywhere. Yes. But no, so I, builders got used to WhatsApp video. Yeah, it's funny enough, I mean, we're diverging here. But... I hired my first remote staff um, because I've got staff in the Philippines and I hired someone back in 2018 and people weren't doing that much remote work, right? I never understood it because I thought it was just as good as someone sitting next to yeah. you, kind of, to some extent. And, and But people didn't really adopt that model. Now, when I was buying properties and you sign uh, uh, you know, bridging finance paperwork, 
and you have to sign guarantees and all those sort of things. My solicitor is based in Brighton. Mm -hmm. I live in Stevenage, which is a two-hour train. Mm -hmm. I, I literally would go to Brighton. I would go to the office. I would be there for two minutes to sign the papers, and then I would get get on the train and go all the way back. So it's, I spent four hours to literally yeah. find, sign the paper because they have to see you. They have to witness okay. the fact that you've signed that paper yeah. in person. COVID happened. All of that went to Zoom and FaceTime. Yeah. All you there, there was another model. They just chose not to adopt. Yeah, they, they chose not yeah. to do it. And so all you have to do was now what I do is I, I get on the Zoom call. I, I sign the paper. I hold it up to the yeah. camera. And they say, yeah, we, you know, we stick it in the post. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stick it in the post. And, and then that that's basically done. Same with bridging finance from a refer facility point of view. So just to explain, when you get bridging finance, they also sometimes give you money for the refurb. But that, it's not like they just give you the money. They first want to see you've actually spent the money yeah. where you said you were going to spend the money. Yes. Right? So what used to happen was someone used to come around and you had to physically go to the property and, you know, show them, well, this is the kitchen and this is the, the monitoring surveyor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What happened in COVID, they said, go to the property, FaceTime us mm. and just show us around. So it's like, why could they not do that, you know, previously? Yeah. And so same with properties. People say, uh, ask me all the time, like, can you invest in properties remotely? And I always say to them, well, you know, there might be some challenges when it comes to reviewing the property initially, but other than that, there's no reason for you to be close to the property. If anything, yeah. the further away you are, the more likely you, you are to put in systems and processes so you don't have to do the stuff in person. The second is on your doorstep, you're there every five yeah. minutes and the builder's calling you saying, oh, can you, you know, check this pane? Can you check this thing? Can you check that thing? So no, no, I'm I'm all about the whole remote. That's, thing. that's interesting, and and I, I I tend to only focus on stuff in the West Midlands. Right, you just get me thinking about what you're what you're saying, and that's really come from at the beginning when I started. Um, you know, I didn't have any money. I started partnering with other people. And I was all really conscious of I've got somebody else's money in this project. I've got to be uh, obsessively in control of what's going on, and it needs to be somewhere I can get to it quite <laughs> quickly. Uh, and now, you know, some nearly seventeen years later, um, we still only invest in the West Midlands. But there's lots of properties I've never been to them before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I would argue, <laughs> why, could, why could they not be two hours exactly, away? Exactly. You've never yeah. even been to them when they're down the road. Yeah, <laughs> it's but, crazy. Yeah, but I, so, yeah, I didn't really go to them much, but um, the Battersea one was I bought that for 237000 Okay. Um, as a one-bedroom flat. So just talk us through then. So you've been doing service accommodation for a little while. You're thinking, okay, you think I need to now purchase... Mm. Um, so was it a case you were saving up money to say, right, I need to now be able to put this into a purchase and that's going to be my first acquisition? Or, or what was the, the kind of... Yeah, correct. That? So, so, we, so we we had loads of SA units and some that were rent to rent mm -hmm. and then some were... Uh, I was managing for other people and I was taking okay. a 10, 20, uh, 10, 15% fee yeah. to manage it for them. So um, someone would take an Airbnb on, yes. I would run the operations, I would take my cut. Did not spend any of that money. Like, you know, didn't spend it on anything uh, because the plan was always... Let's save up as much as possible so we can start buying properties. Yeah. So, yeah, literally did not spend it on anything aside for either getting more rent to rent properties mm -hmm. or just saving up in order to buy something one day. Right. Um, so that's where the money came from. Generally, to get an idea of how much you need, I'd say you typically need one third of the purchase price. Mm -hmm. That's roughly what the mats works out to be. So if you're buying a property for, let's say, 300,000 pounds, you need 100. If, if you're bridging or mortgaging the property. Yeah, if you're mortgaging yeah. the property, yeah. yeah. So you need a 25% deposit in stamp duty and some legals and finance. So it typically comes to about one third. Mm -hmm. So I needed about 70,000, you know, which I had uh, by the time, because I, I, I've been doing Airbnb for about two years. Yeah. Up till the stage. saving that money. Yeah, yeah. Went out buying flash cars and yeah, I mean, holiday to Dubai every five minutes. and Yeah, and then exactly. I, I can't remember. I think I went on like just a normal... Normal Airbnb yeah. holiday. Well, you gonna tell me you've got a war secret supercar or something? <laughs> no, 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 just, yeah. no um, I don't even have a car right now. To be okay. honest, I mean, I, I live at home. I don't have a car, so yeah. I just just use my parents' car when I need to. Fair. I don't, don't, I don't go anywhere. I mean, since COVID happened, especially. I like, I like your thinking on leveraging. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't don't go anywhere, so I don't. I, yeah, I haven't had a car in years. To be honest with you, um, so really, it's a case of not wasting money, saving that money. That money goes down. First purchase is uh, then done. How do you make a decision about what to buy, where to buy that first one? Yeah, so I, I think I, I think that where people go wrong is they, they say, well, I want to do something in property. I want to buy and flip something or I want to do BRR or whatever that is. But they don't actually have the strategy mm -hmm. of how they're going to do that thing. And people think flips and BRR is a strategy. Flips and BRR is like the, the big picture overview, but within... 
within that, you need a specific way of doing it because you can't just BRR a property. You can turn a one bed into a two bed. You can turn a house into two flats, but you know, that's like a tangible outcome. But, but you can't do BRR. That, that's, that doesn't mean anything. Yes. So the first step is always just like a business, right? Like um, if, if, you, if you have a product, then you have to think about, well, how is that going to add value, mm -hmm. right? Like, for example, if you're selling like water, then how is that going to add value? Well, people are thirsty if I sell them, you know, you know like whatever. Yeah. So in a similar way, I, I, the strategy someone told me uh, was, well, if you take a one bedroom and you move the kitchen into the living room mm -hmm. and, tu and turn the kitchen into a second bedroom, yes. that's now going to be worth a lot more than what it was worth as a one bedroom. Yes. And so that, so now I had a strategy in terms of, okay, I'm only looking at one bedrooms, which I'm going to turn into two bedrooms. So when I, when I would go into right move, I had this criteria in mind, which is, well, this is exactly what I'm looking for. This right. is what I need to do. I think where people go wrong is they go into right move thinking I need to do BRR. I just need to find a deal. Yeah. But then it's like every single person who says to me, I can't find a deal. My question always is, well, mm -hmm. what does a deal look like to yeah, you on a piece of paper? Yeah, yeah, describe a deal. And it's, and it's like no one can ever describe a deal because they think that is because they're looking for something but they, they don't know what they're looking for. Correct. So they correct. don't recognize it when it appears. Correct. They actually know what they're looking for. Yeah, yeah. but if you if you say, I'm going to turn a one bed into a two bed, you can have like a very clear criteria, which is, okay, the um, the property has to be 40 plus square meters. It has to have a separate kitchen. Kitchen has to have a window. Kitchen has to be at least seven square meters. So so you have a, you have, you have a checklist. So when you go and right move and you're, you look at a floor plan and you're like, well, this works or this doesn't work. Then you move on to the next yeah. one. This one works. This one doesn't work. You move on to the next one. But without that criteria, you know, I always use the analogy that having that criteria is like going to a supermarket with an ingredient list. Mm. Like you're like, well, okay, I'm going to make pasta. I need pasta, tomato yeah. sauce, and you know, this and that. And you're in and out. Whereas if you go to Tesco thinking, well, I, I just want to cook something, mm. you could be there for hours yeah. because it's like, well, you know, do I get rice or do I get pasta? Do I get this thing? And so that's where people go wrong. So I knew I was going to turn one bed into two beds. Okay. And so I went in with that intention and I was looking for like a good while, you know, find, trying to find yes. a, a property where I could do this and the numbers worked. Yeah. Finding a one bed to turn into a two bed is not the hard part. It's just, you know, getting the numbers yeah, and everything work. else. And the for someone that's watching and listening to this, trying to understand why that works, it's because a lot of property in this country is primarily valued on location, number of bedrooms. Mm -hmm. So where it is and how many bedrooms. So what essentially you're doing is taking property that's one bedroom and reconfiguring that same space to turn it into two bedrooms mm -hmm. and just by doing that it lifts the value yeah it's it, well exactly it's the same it's the same concept if you think about it as taking a property in bad condition and improving the condition yeah. because the condition has now improved it's worth more in this case people are willing to pay more money for two bedrooms mm -hmm. than they are for one bedrooms and so that adds value and because you know that adds value because you know that makes money now it's just a case of finding that yes and and you don't have to do that you could turn you could buy a two bedroom house turn that into a three bedroom house yeah. the same principle but it just means that when you start looking for properties, you know exactly what you're looking for. Yeah. But without that in place, it's just it's too hard. It's too yeah. hard. We've done three bed to four bed houses a number of times, and we look for a certain plan. Yeah, well, exactly. So exactly. You know what to look for because you know it works there. Correct. Uh, and that's what you're then looking for to make that, to, to get that extra value. And then you you're really have two angles where you're making money. You're reconfiguring to create a second bedroom, which creates an uplift, but then you're improving the property as well during that process, Correct. your new kitchen, bathroom, redecorating. So that adds another layer of improvement and an increase in value. Plus, I've, uh, there's another layer as well, which which is a bit more niche, but because I'm, I was buying flats, they were all leasehold. So the last one I did was in West Hampstead in London. It had a lease. Just to explain that, it just means that, you know, when you buy a flat, it's not like you... You, you technically own the flat, but you kind of don't because you own it for 100 years or 125 years. You own it for your lifetime. Yeah, 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 you know, exactly. But, but you don't own the land yeah. underneath. So when a lease gets shorter and shorter, the value of the property is now less because you are essentially owning it for less, uh, a shorter period of time. Theoretically, it has to be handed back at some point. Correct, correct. So that was, it had a lease of 87 years. Now, I extended that to 125 years. Okay. And so that also adds value yeah. because... The value, the increase in the value is significantly more than the cost yes. to increase yeah. that lease. Yeah. So I made money three ways, you know, like yeah. your, to your point, refurb, turning into a two bed and by extending the lease. Excellent. And so, so that's kind of what I was doing. Yes. 
And so is that a model that you've now continue or you evolved uh, from that? Or is that like the core bread and butter? I, I, no, I, I did that five times. So I did that in, uh, sorry, the first one I bought for 237. Mm -hmm. Six months later, it was valued at 320. So it went up by almost 50% yes. just by moving a kitchen around. Yes. Then I bought one in uh, London Bridge. I bought that for 330. It got valued at 450. I bought, then I bought one in Vauxhall for 290, revalued at 390. Brixton, 240, revalued at 320. And then West Hampstead was the best one I did. That was I bought that for three or three, revalued at four fifty. So when okay. I went fifty percent again yeah. by moving the kitchen and everything yeah. else. The th then I wanted to move into something slightly bigger, mm -hmm. and I think you know to to the conversation earlier, which is rent to rent is a stepping stone into this, and I knew this was going to be a stepping stone into something slightly bigger. Mm -hmm. I bought a house which I turned into two flats. That was that was the next logical step for me. That how do I do something? Which is slightly harder, yeah. You know, so that's the evolution of the strategy to the next. Yeah, next step, yeah, because it, it's it's not a huge jump. Yes. You know, but because it's, it's it's only two flats. Yeah. And I think it's one of those things that when when you're starting out, is you know, like it's hard to convince yourself that I'm going to turn a house into multiple flats because it just seems a bit hard, a bit daunting from that point of view. But I I think when you can do something quite small, like turning a one bed into a two bed, just to actually let me go back a step here. I did a, I did five of these one beds into two beds. I did I then bought a house and I turned that into two flats. I then bought a house. I turned that into four flats. Right now I've got a planning application going for a house into six flats. Yes. Now though a house into six flats is so much bigger than a house than a one bed into a two bed, I think if someone does a simple strategy like a one bed into a two bed, you still get like eighty five to ninety percent of the learning curve. Yes. Because the way the finance works, the way the convincing works, the way you get comparables, the way you do stress testing, the way you get builder quotes. It's all exactly the same. The renovation, the conversion. Everything is the same. Yeah, yeah. 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 So 90% of it is exactly the same. So when you go from turning a one bed into a two bed, into a house into two flats, the only increment you need to know is how planning permission works. Mm. When you go from a house into two to a house into a four, the only increment you need to know is how to do a side extension. Yeah. When you go from a house into four to a house into six, that side extension becomes a slightly larger extension. Yeah, but there, it's not the house into a six is six times more complicated yeah. Then a one into a two, yes. it's just slightly more complicated, yeah. but it seems so much harder. At the beginning, it seems like such a uh, such a distance away because we don't understand how to do that. As you said, when you go through the smaller stepping stones, you gain most of the learning. Yeah, yeah. So then you can move on to onto bigger projects. Is that how the 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 portfolio has grown there from zero to to the size it is by following that method? Yeah, yeah for sure. So uh, like I said, I did five of these one beds and mm -hmm. two beds. Which took the portfolio to, uh, I think, around two, uh, one point nine or two point one. I, I, I don't know what the exact number is. I'll have to add up the values. Then I did a house into two, that was valued at four hundred and ten thousand pounds, so that okay. increased it slightly. And then I did a house into four, which was valued at nine hundred ninety thousand pounds. So yeah, it was you know, the these t small one beds into two beds, yes. just moving kitchens around, and then slightly bigger and then slightly bigger. Yes. So if you take this all the way back to the beginning in terms of the things you're doing at the beginning, the amount of profit you make on each step starts to increase. So it's not that you're moving into a, a different strategy or a slightly bigger strategy or you're doing more of them, but the level of profit increases as well, either because of that strategy or because of knowledge you apply to it. Um, so just for, for clarity, for somebody who may be watching and listening, uh, you haven't sold anything along the way. You've no. perfectly added them into your portfolio. So the first one... Uh, they came from the savings of the business that you were running previously, the service accommodation, the the um, profit creating from that. Then how do you then purchase the second one when your money's tied up in the first one? Exp yeah. Through the so, so, like the, said, so the explanation, the BRR. Yeah. So so like I said, because I'm not actually selling and I'm doing BRR, just to so delve a bit further into that and let's go into some numbers as well, which might make the example simpler. Now, when I bought the first one for 237, it was six months later worth three hundred and twenty thousand pounds, right? So it went up quite significantly in the space of six months. Now, when it's worth three hundred and twenty, I then got another mortgage on that property, so refinance. Placement like mortgage. Yeah, so yeah. so a new mortgage which replaces the first mortgage. It's a bit of a confusing concept, mm -hmm. but I I got an eighty percent loan to value mortgage. Okay. Right. Now that meant that I got a huge chunk of my money back, and in the end, that property only cost me it was either twenty nine thousand or thirty thousand. Right? right. So 
it's not like I was investing huge amounts of money. Yes. Because I was getting so I was getting majority of my funds back. Yes. So now I had a lot more thirty thousand pounds, you know, seventy thousand pounds saved up when I bought the first one. Yeah. So I did the first one, refinanced. That only cost me thirty. Then did the next one, I think it was a Vauxhall or something, which cost me like twenty nine. Okay. So I was in for around thirty thousand pounds per property. After after the first few, I then started raising money as well from investors. And they would leave their money in for a longer period of time, and I would pay them interest in order to so so they would help with the purchase, and that the, then they would make interest payments, you know, on the on the loan which I was servicing. So it was a case of using my own savings and also using investors at the same time. But but the key to making the whole thing work was trying to pull out as much money as possible. Yes. In order to repay the majority of that, or you know, release my capital so I could then use that to buy another property. Yes. If I was if, if I wasn't releasing the money, yeah. then it's like. Yeah, it's not, yeah, yeah. Then, that, then it's just, they're saving up for the next one. Yeah, then it's like, yeah, I think I'd probably be on like two or three properties by now yes. um, because it ties up so much of your money. Yes. So in this particular uh, particular model, the the objective really is to try and maximize the value and borrow as much as you can against that new value to get the cash back out. And uh, in theory, uh, the ideal situation being get all your money back out and you've got none of your money left in that property. You need to often do 30% plus uplift in order to achieve that. In this example, you're leaving a little bit of money in about £30,000 in each property, getting a fair chunk of your money back in order to keep growing the uh, growing the portfolio. So one of the challenges with this particular model is because your, your uh, gearing is, is at the higher end, um, your profit each month gets mm -hmm. squeezed mm -hmm. because your rent is, yes, you probably increase the rent because the property is better quality, but your debt uh, servicing of debt is increased as well and the margin is quite tight so s when you're creating trying to create income how is it you can still make that work when your profit each month is very little on each property yeah so because your mortgage is a higher the profit's going to get the profit's going to get reduced yeah for the obvious reasons but i think if you eliminate the metric of profit and look at it as a return on an investment. Yeah, your return probably goes up. Yes. And to, just to explain that, because you know, return I, on capital. Return on capital. Because I bought this property, the first one for two thirty-seven, mm -hmm. right? And in the end, so that cost me seventy thousand pounds. And in the end, I got you know forty thousand pounds back, so it only cost me thirty thousand yeah. pounds because I got so much of my money back. Now that means my capital investment is less than half of what it would have been. Yes. So my profit hasn't come down by less than half because of the fact that I've got a higher mortgage. Yes. So my investment is less than half, but my profit isn't less than half. So therefore, if you, you know, if you do the numbers, that means the return is actually higher. Because I was, you know, well, when I got into buy to lets, I, I did fully accept at the same time that it was going to be a much better investment in the long run than it was going to be in the short term. Yes. So th that's why it's when people ask me, well, what's the best investment strategy? It's hard to give a exact answer because it depends so much on your circumstance. <laughs> I didn't really care too much about how much money I made from the buy to less because I still had some income. rent for an SA yeah. units. You still have an alternative income. Yeah, exactly. I, 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 it's I, not I, that the reliance is only on these. Yeah. Correct. So right now, my house into four flats, I think if you do the numbers, especially because the rates have gone up, that property probably makes around eight hundred pounds per month, mm -hmm. which, which from a cash flow point of view, is pretty poor if you think yeah, about it. A couple hundred pounds per flat. Yeah, yeah. W which is like hardly anything. I mean, I mean, it's still good, but it's not like a huge amount of money. But the Bank of England forecast for the interest rates by 2026, 2027 is that it should come down to around the three percent mark, mm -hmm. right? So let's just assume the mortgages come back down to three point five percent. I paid five point three percent. I was getting three point five percent before all of this mini budget yeah. stuff happened on a on a limited company budget like mortgage. Right. right. So let's say in four years time, three years time, it comes down from five point three percent to three point five percent. Yes. The Savills forecast for rents is that the rents in this country are gonna increase in in the next four years to around eighteen percent. Okay. Which is like four percent per year, which yeah. is again not extreme. I mean that's yeah. typically which is normal. Yeah. <laughs> which is normal anyway. It just comes for an extreme period. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So if the rents go up by 18% and the mortgage goes from 5.3 to 3.5%, the cash flow in that property goes from 800 pounds to 2,800 pounds. Yeah, your gap widens. The gap widens, yeah. right? So I, I know that some, with some of these investments, when I buy them, it's not going to be the best cash flowing strategy in the world. But in two years, four years, five yeah. years, that gap's going to continue to increase 
because what's going to happen is as the property values go up so for example you know th th let's say i've got a property which is worth 450 and the mortgage is 337,000 pounds let's say in five years time that's worth 550 mm -hmm. but my mortgage is still 337 so now my the loan as a percentage is now much it is now is much deep. lower yeah. And therefore, my gearing is automatically dropping. Yes. Gearing even, even though you're, average. Yeah, even though you're not paying down debt. E exactly. Paying interest only. Um, but your your equity is building up. Correct. Yeah, exactly. So I, I look at buy to let property, you, you know, I look at buy to lets as an investment, not as a business. Mm -hmm. And I think too many people look at it as a business that it has to make money right now. Otherwise, I'm not going to do it. So I had a call with someone a few few days ago. And, and he didn't want to do buy to less because he was like, everyone's saying because of the race, it's not going to make any money. And I was like, well, yeah, it's not going to make money in the next six months. Mm -hmm. By the way, when I say not make money, it not still has to be money. profitable, but yeah. not as much money, right? But I was like, you're looking at it as the next six months. Mm -hmm. That's like a restaurant in the middle of COVID saying, well, let's never open a restaurant again because no one's you know coming to eat out anymore. Give it a year, give it two years, give it three years, four years. Especially in this country, you know, it's a tiny island where there's a huge demand for properties and just not that much supply. The rents are going to go up and property values are going to go up. That's, that's pretty much a given. Mm -hmm. It might not be next year. It might not be the following year. But 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, it's going to continue to go up. So that's how I look at buy to property investing as opposed to, well, if I don't make money in the next six months, then I'm not doing it. Yes. Uh, and, I, and I think that's probably the best way of looking at it. Yeah. So let me know if you if your thoughts on this. Often when I was speaking to somebody who wants to give up their day job and get into property and they may have been attracted to the BRR strategy, um, the BRR being your buy, refurbish, rent, refinance model. And I would often say to them is, look, if you're looking to replace an income, a salary, you're going to have to do a lot of those before it probably equates to your salary. So think about this as a strategy for the longer term. So let's say um, I'm speaking to a high earning doctor, for example, they don't need the additional income right mm -hmm. now. They can build for the future. They can build that equity because one of the reasons we're interested in property, we can see the massive growth that happens year, year and year. It might not happen every year, but when you take a step back and you look at the, uh, the long term, you can see the growth and that's why we do it. So we know that property, or we believe that property will be significantly more in the long run, but that's not going to serve you today. Would you say that's kind of a fair assessment? Somebody's looking to replace the income, that probably isn't the route? Or are you saying, actually, they just have to take short-term pain and it will still <laughs> enable them? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. And, you know, if you think about it, if you, if you watch, it's a bit of a catch-22, because if someone left their job, they then wouldn't qualify for a mortgage yeah. to buy the property in yeah. the first place anyway. So I, I, always, I say the same thing to people that, well, you know, you kind of have to be a bit careful about when you transition, uh, you know, from whatever you're doing full time in order to pro uh, in order to get a full time income from property investing, but I, I advocate the same thing. Yes. That if you want to replace your income quickly, buy to let is not going to do it. Like, do service accommodation, do HMOs, or uh, you know, do something else along those lines. A and they're riskier, but they make more money in the short term, and you're more likely to replace your income than you are with buy to lets. Mm -hmm. However, with buy to lets. You know, if you take a ten-year approach, and, and you do it the right way, and you raise, you know, you you pull your money back out, and you have invested in everything else, you're much more likely to be able to replace your income mm -hmm. in a ten-year window, because it, there's there's a set procedure which you can follow, and you know the market's going to go up, and you know the rents are going to go up, and in ten years' time, you'll be in good position. I think the problem nowadays is that, and I've had the same thing, which is. You you want it in like twelve months as yep. opposed to you know in ten years. And buy to let is not the yeah, product. Yeah, the property yeah, and can be a get rich quick. You can get very wealthy in property slowly and steadily. And yes, there are certain strategies you can make a lot of money on. You can often they involve a lot more risk uh, as well, a lot more skill uh, as well in order to to make those kind of things work. You can replace your income by taking a property, flipping it, making fifty thousand pounds. Yes, and that might be someone's salary. Yeah. And so so that, like, you can't do it that way. Yeah. Yeah, of yep. course. Do one a year and you're basically done, right? Yes. But we're talking about it from a long-term portfolio building point of view. If, if you want to build a long-term portfolio, that's not going to replace your job, you know, within, within 12 months. Yes. Un unless you were to do like a really big project, but obviously most people are not doing that when they're starting out. Yes. So, no, I, I agree with you on that one. So, uh, at the time of recording this, we're probably about to see the 13th consecutive interest rate rise from the Bank of England. 
And there's also a report, I think yesterday it was, that the mortgage rates are typically around 6% now. 6% has become mm -hmm. almost like the norm. And how do you think that will impact what you're doing right now? Generally, people in the, the buy-to-let space um, are starting to feel really that uh, that pain trickle down. So I, I think I, I normally break this down into two components. If you're doing something like BRR, the first component is adding value, right? The adding value component doesn't really change because if you if you have a one bed and you turn it into a two bed, well, it doesn't. It's got nothing to do with interest rates. That's just pure capital values, right? If if the market was to drop, that's a different situation. But I'm saying purely the interest rate element itself has nothing to do with you know the capital values when it comes to doing a repo and extending a lease and those sort of things. So that part is largely unaffected. The part which is affected is your cash flow. Now, again, if you think about the cash flow, some some people think that because the rates have gone up, you're not going to make any money and therefore it's risky. But in order to qualify for a budget like mortgage, the property kind of has to make money. Otherwise, you can't get the mortgage yeah. in this country. Yes. You know, because they have to stress test that is this property going to be profitable or not in order, you know, it's a, it's, it's a UK property investing is a business whereby the bank is actually building the business plan for you and, and they're double checking everything and they're verifying is this going to make money or is this not going to make money? Like, like, like you could be an idiot and you still wouldn't be able to get it wrong because the bank has to do their own due diligence yeah. in order to give you the loan in the first place. They're like a 75% <laughs> partner in your business. Yeah, yeah, exa exactly, exactly. And, and so you'll still be profitable but to your point, the profits are going to be slashed. But then if you take the approach of, well, okay, I'll give it a year, two years, three years. Like you look at John Lewis and you look at Lloyds Bank. John Lewis earlier this year or end of last year signed a 500 million pound uh, property development deal, which you might have heard of on the FT and everything else. And because they're not taking a 12 month approach when it comes to property investing. They're taking a 10, 20, 30 year approach when it comes to property investing. And then same with Lloyds Bank. I think BlackRock is also huge in property in the States because they're taking a long-term approach in terms of where they want to place their money. If you take that approach, you don't really care too much about what the cash flow is going to be in the next 12 months because all the forecasts suggest that by 2026, 2027, 2028, the rates will come back down because these rates are not going to... Yeah. They, they won't be able to stay in these rates. rates. You yeah. know, it's not going to stay at, the, at these rates forever. It's just inflation is very high right now and in order to combat that, the rates have to be high. Mm. Once they get a handle on that, which might take 12 months, might take 24 months, it will eventually start to come back down. That's just that's just the economic cycle. You know, this is not the first time yeah. you know, this has happened. Plus, the other thing is, which I think a lot of people don't uh, you know, consider, except for this property, which I've just refinanced, because I, had a, I started this project in the middle of COVID, and then um, the mini budget happened the same week the, where the project finished. All of my other properties are on five-year term fixed mortgages. Okay, put them all onto fixed. Yeah, they're yeah. on five-year fixed mortgages. So I'm not impacted, yeah. you know, when it comes to the other seven that I own. And so, you know, like, for example, some of them, I won't be impacted till 2026 or something. And market by then will be set. Yeah, again. It, it, yeah, exactly. So, it's, you know, sometimes people make it seem like, like, for example, there was a stat that since 2019, 95% of all mortgages in this country were fixed. They were not variable. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, it used to be predominantly variable. Mm -hmm. And since 2019, it's been predominantly fixed. So but what the media does is rates go up and they say, well, everyone's going to be affected. The reality is most people are not going to be affected for two years, for three years, for four years, for five years. Uh, you know, I, I know some friends who bought properties just before the mini budget and they're locked in for five years. Mm -hmm. So they're still on the lower interest rates until 2027. And by then, it's not going to be the same situation as it yeah. is today. So I, I think there's a lot of factors at play, but, you know, it's just more so about your approach. If you're going to invest for the long run, I, I was saying to someone else, that someone's got a clothing business, I know, and um, they, they were talking about property investing. And I was like, well, let's say you make 20 pounds on every single T-shirt. And now, for some reason, the price of cotton and price of fabric goes up. And now you're making nine pounds, right? Yeah. You're not going to get out of that business knowing... That well, okay. There's a there's a I don't know some sort of blip in Bangladesh, Bangladesh or something, and as a result, cotton prices have gone up for the next twelve months, twenty four months, or there's like a drought or something. Because you know, eventually, the price is going to come back down again. Yeah. This is not something which, for the rest of time, now cotton is going to be at, at this price. You just know there's a drought or whatever. However, they make cotton. 
it's a it's a short term thing, and then it's gonna come back down to what it was. Um, if, for example, interest rates, for whatever reason, I mean, it's not really physically possible, but if the government said, okay, from now on, the rates are going to be 6%, uh, and that's it. Like, they're never going to change again. That's a different discussion, because then you might argue, well, actually, well, what's the point? And, you know, because at this interest rate, I'm not making much money. Yeah. But that's not the case. Yeah. But then I think rents would force to go up anyway. Otherwise, it'd be not... Well, really well, exactly, well, exactly. And that's what's happened even this time around, which is that rents have skyrocketed, partly because the rates have gone up so much that the landlords have passed that cost on. Yeah. Um, plus, at the same time, what's happened is, you know, if someone was going to buy a property themselves, they now might not be able to afford a mortgage because the rates have gone up. They can't buy properties. Yeah. They have to rent. The rental demand goes up. Therefore, the rents go up. Yes. So, you know, it's like I, I studied economics at university and the key lesson there was yeah, the reason, you know, everything was so hypothetical when you study economics is because there's no direct relationship. There's, it's not a case of this happens, so that happens. Yeah, it's not one lever. Yeah. Not one lever moves. Correct. Everything changes. Several things are happening at the same it's, time. It's like, it's like you know, like those tiny gears inside like a watch or something. When that thing starts spinning, 50 other things start spinning. Yeah. And you don't fully know what's going to happen because, you know, in this situation, it's easy to say, oh, well, if, if rates go up, everyone's going to sell their properties. Mm -hmm. But in reality, because rates go up, people buy less properties, mm. therefore rental demand goes up, and less people want to, you know, maybe sell their properties because it might be a bad time to sell. And, you know, it's like yeah. there's 20 Many pain fun. reaction. And so it's, it's very hard to say, you know, what's going to happen until it happens. Mm -hmm. I think what's happened this time around is that because there's so much scaremongering in terms of, oh, well, there's going to be a crash and this is going to happen, that's going to happen. If someone doesn't need to sell their properties, why would they sell? Mm. It doesn't make any sense because... People believe that, well, okay, this is a bad time to sell because, you know, the market is so bad. If you're a landlord and you're thinking, well, maybe I want to sell out, maybe I want to retire, you might just wait for two years now, mm -hmm. right? Because well, it's not like you're rushed. The only people who are selling right now, they have to move or they have to relocate yeah, or whatever There's some motivation is. going on right now. With yeah, yeah. They I need to do it now. They can't wait. Correct. You, they might want to move or someone's passed away or whatever. If you're like, mm, well, I can wait, you know? then you're just going to wait. Yeah. As a result of that, where I am, not many properties come on the market. Mm -hmm. Whereas previously, there was, you know, you listing every two minutes, whereas no nothing comes on. Mm -hmm. And if there's not that much supply, even, you know, and even if demand has, if, if supply has gone down and demand has also gone down, well, again, it's hard for prices to drop because now you're on par again. You know, for prices to drop, what needs to happen is, there's a huge amount of supply in the market. Everyone's trying to sell and no one's buying, right? Because that is when you get the discount, when yeah. there's a ton of properties and not many buyers for them. Yes. Right now, it seems like not many buyers, also not many properties. Yeah. Less is being listed on the market. Correct, yeah, correct. Things are taking longer to sell. So in terms of the slowdown, rather than there being a crash in the market, it's just everything's just taking Everything longer just to blow. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and those that don't need to sell, as you say, they're just kind of sitting back and say, maybe we'll just wait a little bit. We don't, you know, we can wait a year or two. You know, in my, I was I was being a property um, a few weeks ago. It was a house, a detached house, mm -hmm. period building, which I wanted to turn into nine flats, mm -hmm. right? It sold for more than asking. Wow. Because it's one of those things that because there's not many big properties yeah. coming onto the market, the people who really want them, they're willing to pay for They'll overpay, yeah. They're, they're it's early. their opportunity. Correct, yeah. correct. So that doesn't then fit in with the traditional supply and demand because it's something a little bit unique. About correct, it. correct. So it's, I've seen so many of those cases where I bid for stuff and I've been beaten because someone's paid more than asking price. Yeah. In an economy where you would think, well, everything should be selling at a yeah. discount. And there's a lot of money still around in the marketplace right now. So even though people have been a little bit cautious and markets a little bit uncertainty in there, there's still a lot of money floating around, which is very different from what it was, say, in 2007, eight that time in the market crash, because there was less liquidity uh, around. There's a, a block of flats that went through an auction uh, just a few weeks ago that we were looking at, and we were very interested in. It had been converted as a large, a traditional grade to listed building, being converted to several flats. And it was a beautiful location. We thought, well, actually, I think, I can't remember the exact numbers, around 500,000. And we thought that's uh, still we get it for six six and a half. That'd be a good buy. Mm. It sold for over a million at the auction <laughs> <laughs> because we weren't the only developers that yeah, 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 yeah. opportunity that was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, exactly. So I, I think, it, I, I always go back to like this Warren Buffett quote when he, you know, when people ask me, is this is today a good time to invest yeah. in property? And uh, he he says that you know like the way he does his business is he he doesn't try to time the market. He looks for good deals, and he knows 
because he's, you know, for example, the way we're banking on the UK economy and the fact that the UK housing is going to go up, he's banking on the Amer on the American economy. Yes. That in 10 years, in 20 years time, the American economy is going to be stronger than what it is today. Yeah. So as long as he gets a good deal today, fine, next year might be bad, the following year might be bad, but eventually in the long run, it's going to pick up. Yeah. So his advice is he doesn't try to time the market. He's not, he's not a trader. He's not, yes. you know, he's not. In our world, a trader would be someone who flips properties. In and out, yeah. Yeah, so someone who's looking to buy something, flip in six months, buy something, you know, flip in nine months. Yes. I, I mean, we're not in the business of flipping. We're in the business of buying and holding. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter as much. Yeah, so it's not timing the market. It's time in the market. Yeah, that's a good way of saying yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. So what's next for you? What sort of projects are you looking at? What do you think the world about Ahmed Khan will look like in the next uh, couple of years or so. Yeah, so like, you know, again, so if someone's starting out, th this is my advice to them because I'm trying to do the same thing, which is you should do something simple like turn a one bed into a two bed, get 90% on the learning curve. The big problem is I still left in 30,000 pounds, mm -hmm. right? Uh, or, or you're leaving 40,000 pounds, 50,000 pounds, whatever that figure is. And so if someone even has a 100,000 pounds, well, that's two properties, yeah. then you kind of run out of money unless you have other businesses or whatever. If, if you can, yeah, you know, let me s sort of step through this example. I did, my last one into two was in West Hampstead. I bought that for 303, refinanced at 450. Mm -hmm. But that actually had a paper profit of about 60,000 pounds. Okay. Paper profit meaning the fact that the profit was there, but I never sold it. So it's not like the money is in my bank account. Yeah. Right? It's in equity. It's locked in the deal. It's locked in. So I, I made 60,000 pounds. But because I refinanced, I had left in fifty thousand pounds, right? Now, hypothetically, let's say you've got fifty thousand pounds, thirty thousand pounds, whatever amount of money that you're starting with, you would then just buy properties accordingly based on you know if you have a lot of money, if you have less money, whatever. Let's say you start off with a hundred thousand pounds, right? You flip something and you make fifty. Sorry, you make you make sixty. Mm -hmm. So now you have one sixty. You then do another project whereby you leave, you know, you hold something. And you leave in fifty thousand pounds. So now you're one hundred and ten. Yeah. Right. Then you again flip something. You make sixty. So you're one seventy. Yes. You hold something. You're at one twenty. And so that way, every time you do two projects, you get all your money back. Yeah. And you end up with a pro uh, yeah. and, and a property at the same time. That can take a lot a long time because you have to do two projects just to hold one property. The reason I moved into turning houses into flats was because hypothetically, you know, if you have a house which you turn into two flats. If you sell one, that makes you enough profit to use as a deposit for the one you're holding. Yeah. And therefore, with one project, you've simultaneously flipped one, held one, and you end up with one flat, which hasn't cost you anything. Yes. So th that's what I'm trying to do myself, you know, by doing a house into two, house into four, house into six. And my plan is going to be going forward that I'm going to sell half, retain half, yes. and get all my money back and essentially do that same exercise again and again. So if someone has... 50,000 pounds, 60, whatever that figure is, they should do something small just to yes. get the learning curve and then try to do it, even if it's a house into two flats, right? Sell one, hold one. Yeah. Next year, do that again. In 10 years, you have 10 flats or 10 properties or, you know, whatever. Yeah. And uh, that that would be, a, I think that's pretty good, you know? Yeah, it's a, it's a smart approach. It is a smart approach doing it in that way. You're using both uh, skills of holding and selling mm -hmm. uh, as well. And then, as you do more, you you just simply get better at it. For sure. If we look at some, like for example, we've been doing HMOs about 11, 12 years. When we look at the very, very first ones we did, the first few years, and we look at what we're producing today, you wouldn't even see any resemblance. They're completely different mm. because each one you get better, you implement more, you change how you're doing things uh, and create a better product, a more profitable product. But that happens through evolution and rather than a big jump. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. So I, I think mathematically if someone wants to scale th that is kind of like the easiest way of doing it I, I i think there's a lot of like false information out there um just on social media and stuff whereby you know mm -hmm. because it's, it's too hard to scale a portfolio just by turning a one bed into a two bed and doing that again and again and again because so much of your money is tied up yeah and if your money if so much of your money is tied up again and again realistically unless you can save up a ton of money every single month for most people, it's not possible. But mathematically, if you can sell one and hold one at the same time, then you can just keep doing that forever. Yeah. Technically, yeah. as long as you have the right deal and you know, obviously all those sort of sort of things. But but technically, you can keep doing one a year, end up with one side a year, two a year, three a year, depending on how big the scheme is. 
And, um, you know, in 10 years, you can have a pretty good portfolio. Yeah. Prices would go up, rents would go up. And, it's, you know, going back to the point that if you if you want a 10-year plan on how to definitely be out of a job, you know, mathematically, yeah. you would get there. Follow the model, yeah. W- with everything else, it's like in 10 years' time, you might get there, but if regulations changes, maybe you won't, you know, maybe you will. It's like, it, it's harder to say. This is slow and steady. Regardless of changes that happen, you'll still get there. Yeah, yeah, ex- yeah. Ex- exactly. So, so that's what I'm trying to do myself, which is, um, like I said, I've got planning. Uh, I'm in the process of trying to get planning for a house into six flats. Let's see how that one goes. Uh, I've done some feasibility studies, which is, uh, I've got one which is a house into six as well, and a couple which are a house into nine flats. But it's a feasibility study. It's so early days. It, you know, it's like right now the likelihood of that happening is like 5%, 10%, because it's so early days. Um, because sometimes people say that, oh, I've got, 50 million in pipeline it's like well you know it's like it's, <laughs> yeah. it technically doesn't mean anything yeah. you know so I, I would say there's a bunch of sites where I'm like 5% of the way through because there's an inkling that this has potential mm-hmm. but there's you know I, there's so much more to do right exactly. planning and well, financing yeah. and this not everything you look at will turn into a correct a, a correct that you are now boning but but that's that's where my focus is which is I want to do stuff which is multiple units because that gives me flexibility. If I want to sell some, if I want to hold some, you know, then I, I've got multiple exits there. But if I just have one unit at a time, it's harder to do so. But that also doesn't mean that someone who hasn't done property, they should do that first up. I still think they should do this, even if it's a refurb, you know, because you learn so much from the simple stuff that makes it easier to do the biggest stuff. If you don't do the simple stuff, yeah. the biggest stuff is just, it's just way too hard. It's the it's best learning is in the doing. Yeah, so only yeah. so much you can learn by watching and listening to podcasts and things is getting out there and doing it is where the best learning is. Yeah, so though I think the house into six flats is a, is a better model, it has a prerequisite, mm-hmm. you know, which is turning a one into a two or turning a two into a three or like in your case, turning a three into a four. Like, like that's, that's almost like though... A level is a better qualification. You have to do GCSEs yes. in order to be able to do A levels, and that's exactly the same here. So I'm not by any means saying uh, scrap everything you know you have consumed so far, or someone might be thinking, well, I'm, I just want to do a simple project. But by no means am I saying scrap everything which you thought about. You should still do that, but do that with the intention that the second I've done that one, I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to do something which is slightly bigger. Mm. And then when I've done that one, I'm going to do something which is slightly bigger than that one. Yes. It's like, th- that is really what you brought to mindset. For sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, this has been such a pleasure. I really enjoyed having this conversation with you. Uh, how can people reach out to you? You've also got a great YouTube channel as well. Tell people where they can find you and how they can connect with you. Yeah, so YouTube would be the main one when it comes to consuming content. Uh, if you want to get in touch, then Instagram is probably best and email. And uh, we can probably link in the description or something cool. along those lines. But yeah, YouTube for watching stuff. And then Instagram and email if you want to get in touch and you know have a chat or something. Excellent. Amit, thank you so much. Brilliant. Thanks for having really me. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Brilliant.